Hello, I'm Carwin Jones, and welcome to this series of podcasts where we talk to the movers and shakers in the Welsh economy. What's their background? What do they see as the challenges? And what's their vision for the future of Wales? I'm delighted to be joined today by Ken Skates, who is the Minister for Economy and Transport in the Welsh Government, of course. Ken, you're very welcome indeed. Thank you. To the podcast. One of the things I like to do is to give our listeners uh, a chance to understand a bit more about the person to begin okay. with. Uh, what it is that took you into politics, uh, what, what your past is, other things you've done, uh, and the road really to where uh, you are now. Well, I was born in 76, um, in the spring of 1976, grew up just outside of Mould, um, which isn't too far from Rithin or uh, Wrexham, um, and I was one of five boys. I was the fourth in uh, in my family, and uh, my mum and dad they at the time uh, worked at the steelworks uh, in Shotton. Um, that subsequently uh, suffered quite a heavy loss of jobs, still a record number of job losses in a single day, um, and it was the consequences of that particular event, albeit many years down the line, that gave rise to my interest in politics. Um, it was the the scars of industrial decline and the unemployment that uh, that was caused by it and the consequences for a huge number of families um, and the divide that it generated um, between the haves and the have-nots, uh, the divide in terms of aspiration, the divide in terms of opportunities. And it, it made me firmly believe that what you're born into, where you're born, should not determine where and how far you go in life and instead we should have an environment and governments in place that support and empower people to be as successful as they can possibly be and in turn to generate a society where there is respect for not what you own but instead what you do and what you contribute and how you help others. And in many ways you're an example of that. You mentioned your parents worked at Shorten. Uh, you went to university? I did. I was the first in the, the family to go to university. Um, when my biography is read out at events it it sounds like I was quite privileged, actually, because I went to the high school, did A-levels, then went to Cambridge University. But um, I was the first to go to university, and I think I was the first to actually study at A-level. Um, and after I started university, two of my brothers um, went back to school, essentially, got uh, GCSEs, A-levels, and went on to university. Um, they're both more qualified than me now. Um, what was the degree in, remind us? Oh, I'm afraid to say it wasn't anything too, uh, uh, something that I'm too proud of. It was social and political science, which is often considered a kind of woolly... Well, it, it is a Cambridge degree, so yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sell itself too yeah. short. <laughs> it included economics and it included yeah. um, uh, politics and psychology, yeah. Okay. And of course, into elected politics. Yeah. Uh, what, what prompted you to, uh, to understand for election? So I'd resisted the... Uh, the thought of standing for election for a while. Um, I was very interested in politics from an early age, a very young age. Um, but uh, I think it was probably an interest in current affairs and then journalism. And from journalism, I then went to work for a member of parliament and realised that at some point, uh, if you believe in something, you've got to stand up and try to do something about it. So um, I sought uh, election to, first of all, a community council. The Pantamoon and Gwynafield Community Council and uh, still to this day I look back and uh, and think actually being elected to a town or community council can be a hugely rewarding exercise because you do, albeit on a very small geographical basis in terms of numbers, you do have the ability to make quite an impact and really change a community. So although all I was doing really was managing the or helping to manage the budgets for streetlights and stuff, I also had an opportunity to run events like treasure hunts, um, uh, an annual uh, daffodil planting exercise. And over time, it was, you know, it was it was great to be part of, back then, part of a movement to raise pride in the community. And, and it was really rewarding as a result. And uh, I think that then led me to believe that actually uh, it might be useful to go for election to, uh, if you like, a, a, a higher body. And um, And I had been interested in devolved powers since 1999 over um, uh, Westminster politics. Even though I've been employed by an MP, it struck me that, again, if you if you really want to make change at a local level, do it through a decision-making process that is very relevant and available. And, of course, 
with more powers being devolved to Wales, it made more sense, therefore, to seek election to the National Assembly for Wales. And that happened um, in 2011. Um, I was elected Assembly Member for Clwyd South, and I, um, I, I'm the second Assembly Member for that seat, my predecessor being Karen Sinclair, who, um, who is a fantastic character and, uh, and still lives in Clangothlan. Of course, of course. Very so you, proud Langhoffman resident. You elected in 2011. You've been a cabinet minister now for just for three years, isn't it? Since 2016. Yes, it is. Minister of Economy and Transport. Yeah. Lots of challenges, which we might yeah. come on to uh, later. But of course, one of the uh, great changes has been the establishment of Transport for Wales. Yes. Uh, and uh, the establishment of a, of a government-directed yeah. uh, organisation to deal initially with rail transport. How do you see that developing in the future? Well, a bit like Transport for London. Um, what strikes me with Transport for London is that people feel there's an, the pride in it, first and foremost, and they feel that there's ownership. It represents who they are. It represents their place. Um, and you can go to London now and you find that there are T-shirts, there are posters, all with underground symbols on, with the maps of the underground, with um, um, all transport-related merchandise demonstrating that there is pride in what what happens on, on the transport front in the city. And... Um, Transport for London is something of a template for Transport for Wales. Um, it's it's on a journey itself. Um, we're all on the rail journey, the new franchise journey, but actually Transport for Wales is growing, it's expanding, and I'd like to see um, more fun- functions trans- transferred over to Transport for Wales um, in order to fully integrate transport across Wales, to make sure that road planning is done in a way that uh, reflects what's happening in terms of urban planning and in terms of planning for rail services and rail infrastructure and bus services and bus infrastructure rather than have um, delivery and planning um, carried out on a piecemeal and broken basis. If we look at the economy then, Mm. uh, we know there are challenges, we know there are opportunities, we know that there is a a very large uncertainty uh, called Brexit which uh, is an uncertainty whichever way you look at it. If we start first of all then with the challenges, what have you identified in the last few years are the the main challenges that uh, you think we still need to overcome? Well, Brexit's the big um, problem on the horizon. Um, however, product productivity remains an ongoing challenge for us. But if we just te- take a step back and look at where we are compared to 1999, or indeed, the, let's go back even further and say the early 1990s, there's a pretty remarkable story to be told. We've now got a record number of people in employment. Unemployment is at or near a record low for the first time ever. Economic inactivity is at or below the UK level, and about 300,000 more jobs have been created in Wales since 1999. Um, And in terms of productivity levels, they're improving, and they're improving faster than the UK average. The, but there the is, reason for that is, I mean, we, we, we know there's been a productivity problem, not just in Wales, but across the UK. Is it to do with better training, or are there, are there other factors? Do you know? Yeah, there are, there are a number of factors that contribute to the level of productivity that a nation enjoys. One is the level of skills um, available to the economy. And again, we've, we've got a great story to tell since 1999 in terms of reducing the number of people without um, qualifications and improving the levels of qualifications that people have. But um, there is still more w- work to be done. Infrastructure is crucial as well, uh, connected infrastructure. And then thirdly, the OECD have um, demonstrated that um, the number of businesses within tradable sectors is crucial in determining how um, how an economy um, measures up against others in terms of productivity. And in recent times, we've seen tradable sectors such as the financial and services sector and uh, the creative industries really boom in Wales. And that's why productivity has increased faster than the UK average but we're still catching up. There's a big gap. And so as we, and this is why I think the Brexit issue is very important. So as we consider how to raise productivity levels, we cannot lose sight of the fact that those nations that enjoy um, higher levels of productivity are those nations that are most globally exposed. And with Brexit, there's a real risk that we end up becoming more protectionist. Um, Now that in turn would hammer not just the UK's overall level level of productivity, but Wales is as well, given how dependent we are on international markets, and particularly given how reliant we are on the EU in terms of exports of goods and services. 
We, we know that Brexit sits there as the great uncertainty. It's had a deadening effect. There's no political debate for three, more than three years now. Yeah. Are there any Brexit-proof opportunities, do you think, that uh, we could look at in Wales? There could be. Um, I say there could be because we just don't know how we're going to leave and if we're going to leave um, on Halloween. Um, there could be opportunities concerning state aid rules um, and procurement rules, but none are going to mitigate and compensate for the loss of frictionless free trade with the EU. That, w- that will be devastating, um, not just in the short term, but for decades to come. Even people like uh, Rhys Mogg have said that it could take several decades for us to turn the corner um, in terms of economic decline. And so I think whilst we may be able to find opportunities and exploit them to the full, we have to be reasonable and, and realistic about this. It's going to be a really difficult time for us. Well, I think Jacob rees was quoted recently as saying that uh, a no-deal Brexit would mean an extra £80 billion being injected into the UK economy. He didn't expand on that, I must say. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, we do know that whatever you have your Brexit, and there'll be people with different views listening to this, it has caused uncertainty. And that does make it, of course, much more difficult. And I know that the government's time has been swallowed mm-hmm. by, by Brexit and, and yeah. getting getting ready for it when uh, you know, other things might have been possible to do. And that's the same of, it's in, in Whitehall as well. And there are real examples of investments either being halted or paused. Mm. Um, companies that are not investing, not expanding, um, that are looking for potential ways of getting out of the UK. This is a major challenge and we're seeing it um, principally in the at the moment in the automotive sector, which is already facing huge challenge in terms of automation and the demise of the internal combustion engine, the, the move towards electrification, which some companies are not moving fast enough to. We often hear talk of the fourth industrial revolution. I mean, it's been mentioned several times in the Assembly. What does that mean to you? And I suppose the question a lot of people are asking is, is this, and there's no easy answer, in previous industrial revolutions, more jobs were created mm-hmm. as a result of mm-hmm. them. But is there a danger this time that because of automation, that that won't happen? We just end up with a, a, a large number of people who are basically unemployable and can't find a job. Uh, and it, you know, that's a great uncertainty, isn't it, that we uh, that we see. Do, do you think that's, a, that's I, a, a, an analysis or do you think there are based, better opportunities? Based on the evidence I've seen, um, I think we should be more optimistic about the prospects that uh, that are to come in the fourth industrial revolution, which is already underway. Um, and in every other re- industrial revolution, as you say, more jobs have been created than have been lost. Um, but more people have been um, afraid of the revolution than have embraced it. The key for us, if we want to get maximum benefit from um, the move towards automation and AI and so forth and digitalization, we have to embrace it. We can't be looking to the past nostalgically or fear in the future. We have, we've got to invest in businesses that are sustainable in the long term. And that, of course, will lead to difficult decisions, but we've got um, an economic action plan in place that's designed to supercharge those industries of tomorrow and invest in skills and in automation, rather than to try to fight the tide and what is inevitable, which is creation of more higher value jobs, but of course, the loss of other jobs in other areas um, and significant change to a vast amount of jobs that are currently um, currently operational. But unless we actually get on board this movement um, through the fourth industrial um, revolution and embrace the opportunities that are to come, we will suffer as a consequence because there are many countries out there that are moving in at full pace to take full advantage of automation. Final question then. We, we're now looking towards the, uh, the future. In 10 years' time, what would you like to have seen happen in Wales? What would be your, your, your vision for the, the next decade? 2030, um, if we leave the EU uh, later this year or might be early next year, what I'd like to see by 2030 is for the UK and Wales to have rejoined. Um, because I don't think our move out of the EU, our leaving the EU is just about economic um, concerns although they are very significant, obviously. I think it demonstrates, unfortunately, a, uh, a retreatist attitude and a protectionist attitude that we're witnessing around the globe, but which the UK seems to have acted on more than any other country. And 
that's incredibly dangerous because protectionism is the greatest threat to the economy. It's also the greatest threat to our security around the world. And so in order to um, rectify what we're going through at the moment, and it is a bizarre period, um, I'd like to see Wales and the UK as a whole together uh, rejoin the EU. Time will tell. Uh, this is the most unpredictable period of politics I think that we've seen for many, many, many decades. Yeah. Uh, each day seems to bring something, uh, something new and something even stranger that we have to uh, to deal with. But of course, um, from your position, it's a question of getting on with the job as you are uh, and trying to uh, to promote Wales even with Brexit. Uh, how important, I mean, final question for me, very last question, how important is the international dimension for you? How important is it for us to, pr- to project ourselves around the world? Hugely important. Reputations are vitally important in terms of being able to attract the, the sort of investors that we want, responsible business. You have to be seen as a responsible country and an outward-looking country. And Wales needs to therefore portray itself as a 21st century country looking outward, reaching out rather than a 20th century country that is retreating and building walls around itself. Ken Skates, Minister for the Economy and Transport, thanks very much for joining us today. Pleasure.